Well, friends, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It starts with a sticky dryness on your tongue. And you might notice it at first, but you you can still focus on other things. But eventually, your tongue starts to stick to the roof of your mouth. And so you begin looking for water. And, and if you don't find water soon, well, then you, you finally reach the point where you can't think about anything else other than water. You just want to gulp water. And even if it's just a little bit of water, that will be enough. But, but really, you get so thirsty that, that you're at the point where you reach for anything at all that is wet even if it's just a few drops of water or maybe chewing on ice. And if you still can't find anything, and there's no water in sight, well, then your mind starts to feel kind of frantic. Your mouth starts to gape open because you can't bear the stale taste of your own breath. And you start to feel desperate. And if it's a hot summer day, or you've been outside working a long time, or you're on a hike, or you've eaten a few too many french fries, <clears throat> that thirst starts to turn into an emergency. And, and if you still go without water, if you go without water for too long, well, then your body can even start to shut down and eventually even die. Water is life. And if you're thirsty, nothing in the world tastes better than a tall glass of cold water water. We are made for water. Water is the first thing mentioned in creation. God planted a tree of life in Eden, and then Genesis paints a picture of rivers carrying that life to the rest of creation. And Genesis 2 paints that picture for us using these words, right? It says, A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Bedellium and onyx stone are there. And the name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. And Genesis goes on to paint this picture of perfection. And, and you can kind of imagine what life what might have been like for Adam and Eve in that well-watered world of perfection and immortality with abundant and well-watered vegetation and happy animals. And of course, those beautiful landscapes. Water is life. But can you imagine what it would have felt like for Adam and Eve the first time they felt thirsty? How scary that would have been for them? Exiled from the garden and cut off from the tree of life and that living water all dammed up? Adam and Eve 
were sentenced to an unnatural death. And that living water had given them eternal life, and now this new thing called thirst threatened eternal death. Can you imagine what it would have felt like for them the very first time their dry tongues started to stick to the roofs of their mouths? What in the world is going on? See, that thirst came with other things, too, didn't it? It wasn't just thirst that they experienced outside of the Garden of Eden in a cursed world. There was other things, too, and not just a physical thirst, but a spiritual thirst. It was a love for one another that began to run dry. It was the stickiness of sins and addictions and the scorch of this new thing called violence in a sinful world. It was the desperation of sickness and disease and, and the yearning for a better kind of life. See, the curse of the world is like thirst, a deep thirst where the absence of the source of life means that life is not right. It means that outside of this garden, outside of that source of living water, we live a wrong kind of life. We are exiles in a desert wilderness outside of Eden with a drought in our hearts and an unholy dehydration that leads to death. But it's in that spiritual thirst, in that world of thirst, that Jesus cries out. And you just heard these words a few minutes ago. Anyone who is thirsty may come to me, says Jesus. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. And of course, the Apostle John adds that little explanation, right? When he said living water, he was speaking of who? The Spirit, who would be given to everyone believing in him. But the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet entered his glory. Friends, Jesus is the source of life that living water brings. Outside of the garden cut off from the tree of life and the living water that provides that life. Outside of the garden, you and I live a wrong kind of life. Life is just not right. It's not the way it should be. But Jesus comes into our world as a source of living water, a source of a new kind of life. Jesus restores the right kind of human life to our world by living that right life in our world. Jesus is like a new tree of life. Jesus is like Eden's tree of life in human form walking around in our desert wilderness. Jesus is the source of life that quenches death. Anyone who thirsts Come to Jesus and drink. That sounds kind of weird, doesn't it? Drinking from a person? Come to Jesus and drink? Drink from Jesus? You know, we live in a world that is so desolate 
It doesn't even know that it's thirsty. It, it, living water, a source of water that can quench thirst, and I'm talking about spiritual thirst, sounds foreign. They don't even know that that living water might exist. And, and when our spirit parched world hears God's refreshing word, it doesn't make sense. It sounds weird, as weird as something like drinking from Jesus might sound. A few moments ago, we heard the story of Pentecost read for us again. And, and, and I'm sure that maybe most of us in this room are familiar with that story of Pentecost. Of course, when, when the Spirit came and, and, and there was tongues of fire over each of the disciples, and, and they were able to speak in different languages so that God's people could hear God's word in their own native languages. And of course, these are full of miraculous events, right? Miraculous events worth remembering and worth celebrating. Friends, I got to tell you, I, I don't think that tongues of fire and speaking in different languages was the greatest of all miracles on that first Pentecost. And I don't think that the tongues of fire and speaking in different languages were even necessarily the point of Pentecost. I think it was something deeper. I think that the real miracle of Pentecost is that the Spirit came as a river of living water from Jesus to bring life from Jesus through God's Word. That's the miracle of Pentecost. We have access by the Spirit to the source of life in Jesus. The Spirit empowers God's people to proclaim that life-giving word from God. That's the miracle of Pentecost. And at first, it sounded weird to the people gathered there that day, didn't it? It sounded as weird as drinking from Jesus. It sounded weird to the ears of those hearers. Like the disciples had been sipping a little something and it wasn't really water, right? Right? It, it even says that, doesn't it? The crowd ridiculed them, Acts chapter 2 says. The crowd ridiculed them saying, they're just drunk, that's all. And then Peter stepped forward with the other 11 apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem, make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk as you suppose, as you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. You got to love Peter, right? <laughs> he knows when it's time to drink and when it's time not to drink, right? But, but it's, it's just like the world, isn't it? It's just like the world to hear sin-quenching gospel and to mistake it for drunken nonsense. Isn't it? To our world, the gospel sounds like foolishness. And to the world, each of you looks like a fool for even being here this morning. To the world, the gospel is like drunken nonsense. And the people of that first Pentecost day, they mistook the living water of Jesus for alcoholic drink. And, and so that, that's why I think that the true miracle of Pentecost is that the Spirit takes God's word that sounds like drunken nonsense, and, and, and he uses that same word to work in people the miracle of faith. And so you know, when Jesus was hanging on that cross, right, dying for your sins and mine, when Jesus was hanging on that cross, a soldier pierces Jesus' side to verify his death. 
And from Jesus' heart flows sin-atoning blood with what? What flowed with the blood? Water. Blood and water came from Jesus' side. And just like the tree of life and the rivers from that tree of life in the Garden of Eden, Jesus is the source of life. And the Spirit is the living water from Jesus that brings that life, his sin-atoning blood, to the world. See, this Pentecost day that we celebrate today, and that first Pentecost day that we remember, Pentecost is Moses' words of prophecy fulfilled. You remember those words that Moses spoke? Let's read these together right now. I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them all. You know, sometimes we think that prophecy is just fortune-telling, right? Pro- that prophecy is predicting the future, and it, it can be that, but, but most of the time, and primarily, prophecy is speaking God's word into a situation. And and, and most of the time, it doesn't even have to do with the future. It's just, here's what God's word says, and here's what it means when we apply that word into our lives. When When you make that connection, that's prophesying. And Christians are people who trust that the Spirit works through, through them and through God's word, and applies his word to our lives. And that's why Christians are people who are deep in the Bible. We get to know the Bible. We get to know the truth of God's word. We find that truth, and we bring it to our lives. And we are also people who take that truth, and we speak that truth, prophesy, into the lives of others. Now, now I got to tell you, sometimes I hear people say, Well, that's the pastor's job. There's sometimes where I wish I could say that too, and then I remember I'm the pastor. See, the pastor's job is to authoritatively and publicly teach that word and make sure we get it right, and then to administer God's word through the sacraments on behalf of you, the church. That's what the pastor's job is. But friend, I got to tell you, Pastors do not have exclusive rights to God's word. God's word is for all people. God's word is for all Christians. And a Christian's job might be different from a pastor's, But a Christian's job is still to know God's word well enough in order to prophesy that word to others. And prophesying that word to others means speaking God's word to your family and to your friends and even to total strangers. Prophesying God's word might mean having your grandchild on your knee and reminding them that Jesus loves them. That's prophesying. It might mean praying for your friend when they're going through a hard time and reminding them that they have a God who loves them and provides for them. That's that's prophesying. And it might even be when you're at the checkout in the store, right? And and the cashier says, well, why are you so dressed up today? And you get to tell them that you went to church. And they ask, oh, what's that like? And you get to tell them, that's prophesying. Prophesying. Your job as a Christian is to know God's word well enough to prophesy it to others. And that might sound scary. And I got to tell you, while God's word has a lot to say, 
at its core. It teaches us God's design for the world and how far we fall short of that design. But then God's word also tells us about God's forgiveness and his promises for the world through Jesus. And so every Christian can speak that word because the power is not in you, the Christian. You don't have to worry about how crazy it might sound coming from your lips. you got to know it. But you don't have to worry about how it comes across. Of course, do it in love, right? But the power does not come from you. The power in God's word comes from the Spirit. See, the power is from the Holy Spirit blessing that word to work faith in others. And he does that even if we sound like we're drunk to the world. Because on that first Pentecost, the disciples themselves went from being accused of being drunk to then later on baptizing 3,000 people that same day. See, the Bible begins with a picture of rivers flowing from the tree of life into the rest of creation. And Jesus is the new tree of life with the living water of the Holy Spirit flowing from him into the rest of the world. And then the Bible ends that same story with a renewed creation, heaven on earth, and a worldwide Eden with trees of life lining rivers flowing from the throne of God. Friends, that is our promised future. And if that's your future and that's my future, then as the church of God, we are thirst quenchers. Our calling is to trust that the same Spirit of God who went and blessed the disciples on Pentecost, that that same Spirit of God works through us to faithfully speak God's Word into the lives of others. Friends, there is a thirsty world out there. Let's go give them a drink. In Jesus' name, amen.